uh, tonight's session, we really want to uh, cover first and foremost um, what the challenges a 20th century economy now presents, now that we're fully 22 years into uh, the 21st century. Uh, and Nicolette will also share um, her positions on um, what a modern economy looks like and um, what needs to be done to get there. Uh, and we also want to provide everyone plenty of opportunity to ask um, Nicolette uh, questions uh, in this important area. Um, and so we'll spend about half an hour on, on um, sharing, you know, the current state of the economy, um, what an alternative approach to managing the economy can look like, and what the magical prize actually is, um, actually having a modern economy. Um, it would be remiss not to at least touch on um, the budget tonight. So we'll have a brief uh, conversation um, about the budget, um, and then we'll have the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, hand over to, to Nick. So over to you, Nicolette, to talk through your economic priorities. Thank you, Ed. Uh, and before I do launch into that, I just want to um, cover off a question that people ask me frequently, which is, I know that the party, what the party stand for, but you're standing as a community independent. So what are your policies and how will you form positions on key issues? Um, that's the purpose of this slide. I, I've got a background in policy, so I know it's more, um, it, I know that it, it requires deep research and analysis and discussion and uh, you know, review and redrafting and so forth. And it's a very considered process. And that's why I'd like to impress that tonight, I won't be giving you my policies. I'll be giving you my thoughts and positions on what a modern economy could be for us. Um, but when I'm elected, um, I'll need to form positions on drafted laws. And what you see in this schematic is how I shall develop my positions for and on behalf of the people of Bradfield. So um, thank you, Ed. So when we um, talk about the state of the economy, we ask ourselves the big question, well, how well is the economy going? And the answer for me is a function of how one defines the concept of well or wellness. So take, for example, current commentators who look at the usual metrics. I've got some of them on the slide there um, to measure the economy's wellness. And I'm going to, in the next few slides, for about five minutes, I'm going to run through here um, what those look like and also to why I think there's some quite significant shortcomings in those metrics. But let's start with the good story. And the good story is about employment or unemployment, or what I like to call participation. Um, having people employed is a great thing for a large number of reasons. A few of them are that workers pay personal income tax. They have income to spend on goods and services in the economy, which means more income tax through expenditure on things like GST. And of course, that's more receipts for government. And also people are very busy and they're not rioting in the streets. Also why we send our kids to school, right? So the, uh, the government's record on this is, is strong, um, but it's important to note uh, that the definition of employment assumes a number of things. Uh, that uh, it, it only really includes data about people who are looking for work um, and haven't given up already. And also it includes data for everyone in the economy employed and paid for at least one hour per week. Just one hour per week is the definition of employment for this. So the metric doesn't tell us about whether that employment is secure and it's sufficient to give people a living wage. All right, let's go to GDP and productivity as well. Gross domestic product, that's the total monetary or market value of all the sort of finished goods and services produced within our, in our borders. And what's important is this concept, not just of GDP, but the change in the rate of GDP growth. And it's used to determine whether an economy is expanding or contracting and whether we're heading towards um, into a recession, for example, as we did last year when we had three consecutive quarters of negative growth. Um, but GDP is up um, and you kind of hope it would be up because it's <laughs> up during COVID, nothing happened. So we expect that big spike here in, in FY22 and onward. So but the two, ch two challenges with GDP as a concept is it's agnostic to how that growth is clocked up. So GDP as a concept was created in the 1930s and it assumes growth forever is possible. And it's always a good thing. 
Now we know when we have a natural disaster like the Lismore floods, plural intended, our GDP goes up and the balance of payments also improve, improves our, our terms of trade. Why does it go up? Because crisis and emergency services, public and private, um, are dispatched. There's transactions in the economy for construction and rebuild, civil engineering, insurance and reinsurance. All of these things contribute positively to GDP, even though, of course, the human cost is a negative thing. So the two things are not telling exactly the same story, if you like. And I'm being a bit cheeky when I suggest that maybe this is why the government's okay to have more natural disasters. But look, GDP as a metric is um, losing its usefulness in the 21st century, but there are other metrics. So I'm gonna go on to productivity specifically. How much inputs required to produce every unit of GDP? So the second challenge I have is that in every unit of gross domestic product created, Australia consumes more energy and water than any other country in the world. And it's second only to the United States of America for the volume of waste it produces. So this tells me that we're very inefficient when we're technically not productive, um, we're sluggish and we're lazy. And this graph shows, um, it's from the Business Council of Australia, it shows that lump but definitive decline in the productivity over time. The little gray box in the top right hand corner is the OECD report also from this period showing Australia compared to others in terms of productivity. And our own um, CEDA, our Com Committee for Economic Development Australia, next slide, thanks Ed, who last week reported Australia had fallen four places to 22 in the global ranking on competitiveness out of 64 nations. It's Australia's worst result in 25 years. Um, I, sorry, in the slides, a little bit difficult to read, but basically it's a snapshot from the yearbook that compares our nation on a range of metrics and it shows a general downward trend in performance for many of the vital aspects of our economy. So let's go to the important stuff, uh, the stuff that directly impacts people, including the people living here in Bradfield. So we've been told that the economy's doing well, um, but why does it feel so difficult to get so difficult to get by? Why are there so many shops for lease in our shopping villages? And as a business owner, why can't I get any staff? The cost of living is increasing for a number of reasons, including the fact um, or this feeling in the sense that wage growth has stagnated. So the Reserve Bank and the unions, um, strangely, <laughs> agree on one thing, of course, which is that wages need to increase. And because the cost of living increases are outstripping the average person's ability to meet their basic needs. There's the cost of food, there's petrol, there's the cost of insurance. If you've had to um, you know, reinsure your car lately, premiums are going up housing affordability, particularly affecting young people trying to buy, but also renters, because there's very low vacancy rates and high rents. Um, high, rising interest rates, um, and the RBA was out today urging um, that the rates get increased. If you've got money in the bank, in terms of deposits, it's not such a bad thing, but it will really heavily impact on indebted families with large mortgages. And so the government has so much more it needs to spend money on as well. We've got a crisis in our aged care sector. It's going to cost billions to fix it. We've got a crisis in our healthcare sector. In infrastructure, we've got roads that are crumbling um, and resident residential areas that can't get schools. And there's just hundreds of millions of dollars thrown at projects without business cases, frankly. So meanwhile, the government has put down this budget um, and on the eve of an election, that includes a, a cut in fuel excise. But when I look at that, I just see it as a band-aid. It's temporary and it puts the government income position in a even worse off position. And um, it does nothing to structurally adjust our economy to be more resilient to things like peaks in oil prices. So the take home story is that with the status quo, um, things are only gonna get worse. And the government hasn't really provided a solution that's going to stick um, and fix things into the future. Um, next slide. Our national account and the government's own performance on raising funds and spending funds or um, this sort of question around are we in a deficit or surplus. So with respect to debt, we have a truckload of it. It's never been bigger. We've borrowed and spent a lot of money with interest rates set to rise and about to push that ever-increasing debt onto our kids and onto future generations. 
But I want to state something a little controversial here, and that is a large debt doesn't have to be a bad thing if we know that it's being used to build the kinds of physical and social infrastructure that we need to make our economy fit for coming decades. If we knew the government wasn't was investing in the electricity grid and the EV network to help electrify our economy so that we can plug into cheap, abundant and reliable renewable energy uh, on which to build a manufacturing sector uh, and the rest of the economy. And then spending would have a temporary impact on the national accounts because productivity and our balance of pay payments benefits, for example, reduced oil imports would start to kick in. So in this storytelling um, about the way we measure the state of the economy, I wanna say that on most of the vital signs, things aren't going well. And the two things we do know about our economy is in that 2022, um, what we know about it now after this budget is the economy was in a really bad state even before COVID. And the advent of COVID has only worked to reveal the economy and the society's stress points. So we know that the malaise in our economy is not a new thing. We've had for several decades reams of reports made um, by experts from the Productivity Commission, Infrastructure Australia, the Henry uh, Review on Tax. They've all told us that our system's not working as it should and as it can. And we have all of these types of royal commissions and their recommendations identifying that the system's broken and needs fixing. But the experts are telling us this, um, that there are other things to measure and that we need to manage things differently. We just need a government that breaks the status quo and gets on and gets it done. Um, and in this uh, slide, Professor Ross Garno's book, Reset, um, published this year, he talks about the fateful choice and Australia faces, faces its sixth fateful choice. And since Federation's had um, three of which it's handled reasonably well, to which it has not. But this post-COVID response is a fork in the road for the Australian economy. And we've heard that this government wants to claw back spending and to reduce debt. Um, is, that the res is that responsible when our economy is broken and needs fixing? And the answer to that is um, not with this current federal budget <laughs> proposed for the financial year. This is not a budget that's gonna fix anything. It's not a long-term budget. In fact, I'm fairly generous when I say this budget's gonna probably get us through May um, in terms of the fixes. But the great news is that um, we can do things differently. And this is how, in, when people vote into the 47th parliament, people with real world experience that haven't been shackled to a party line, we can help break the gridlock on issues such as economic reform, which the experts have been crying out is needed from as way back as um, 2010 when Ken Henry dropped his tax reform um, recommendations, all 138 of them. So my career has shown me that if this is not a trade-off between the environment and people's rights and the economy. In fact, when you put people and planet at the center of business and government decision-making, you get the sorts of business and economic outcomes that steps, steps us up to prosper in the medium and the long-term. Um, this new way of looking at economics is, is actually not that new. It's been around since the 1960s, maybe even before, but it really caught my eye. Um, and on this slide is Kate Walworth's uh, Donut, Econo Donut Economics um, Theory. And I realize I probably should have put a, a, um, a, a, a source on that. Apologies, Kate, but I will. Kate's view is that there's this ecological ceiling to our economy. In other words, growth just can't go on forever not in the way that we define it at the moment. And then there's a social foundation which gives us that minimum viable product in terms of the human condition, access to food, to water, energy and education and various others in there. Our current economic paradigms have us overshooting on the earth's physical carrying capacity. That's what you're looking at in terms of the heating climate and the heating um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions in the, in the atmosphere and providing a shortfall on many of those social conditions that we expect as human beings. So when we make decisions in our economy um, within these parameters, we still have economic growth, but in a less materially consumptive way, it's more of a really restorative and regenerative economy um, cycle. So we need to make certain decisions that ensures that nobody gets left behind 
and we can, everyone can meet their basic needs. Now, the great news is that we've already seen that we can have economic growth, so rising GDP, without growth in energy consumption. And we've watched that happen in Australia. It's a recently new phenomenon in our economy, but it's made possible due to energy efficiency, innovations, and it's going to be even more spectacular with embedded and distributed energy generation. And there's more of this where it comes from, uh, where this comes from in terms of like impact investing, ecotourism, B corporations. There's just many movements afoot uh, taking on this concept. I'm really keen to bring this thinking to the terms of reference for um, the economic reforms that this nation needs. But let's start with a plan for our energy sector for 2030. Um, or to set the principles we want to use to build our economy and then get to work to examine the ways that we can deliver the reform that all the experts tell us we need to do. Um, sorry about that, I was a bit lost, found it. Okay, so what's the prize? The prize of a modern economy it looks a little bit like this, I think. Um, we, it's, a, it's a glittering one. It's, it's marvellous. Um, but before we go there, I have to really impress that we have to put a federal ICAC through first. We need the integrity and the accountability reforms. So when the government does make decisions on how it allocates money into the economy and into communities, we can interrogate the rationale and the efficacy of those decisions made and acted upon. That's absolutely key. Major parties are not getting it done. Independence can help to break that gridlock. Okay, so to me, a modern economy is fair, sustainable, and productive. You might want to choose words like resilient, secure, safe, equal, competitive. But it, what it is, it's decentralized to improve resilience. It's local to improve our national security. It's renewable to improve our climate. It's fair to improve equality. And it's productive to improve our competitiveness. And Australia is so naturally endowed with its large land mass and a very large coastline, heavily, un, heavily urbanised populations and abundant sunshine. We have also largely neglected our energy system to date for decades. So we don't really need to transition. We can just step into a clean energy future for domestic use. I'm making it sound easy, but it's actually not too hard. So once this is done, we can produce materials and processes 100% built on built on cheap, safe and abundant renewable energy, which allows us to turn back to manufacturing and or at least industrial processes and minerals processes so that we can move more smartly and add value to our precious minerals assets before we export them to other markets. We will have an economy where we are in control of our energy and not controlled by OPEC. We will be filling up the car um, when it's parked at home or at work um, during the day. Uh, we're never going to be going to a petrol station again, and it's going to cost us $46 to fill up a tank. Our transport is going to be quite quiet and clean and safe. And because it's renewable energy, we can also afford to grow more food in glass houses, closer to market, reducing transport costs and fuels, and with fewer pesticides and less food waste. But our economy will lean into less plastics, and more bioproducts, which is going to be a boon for our farmers and for foresters. And it means we again are less reliant on oil imports. And this is just a list of decarbonizing the economy. And our modern economy is more than that. It's about looking at building out our workforces. It's about celebrating diversity and culture, and it's about being inclusive. So the prize, the prize is that, that we, we just need to use our economic and fiscal systems to deliver what we need to ensure that our economy is competitive into the rest of this century. And we're coming late to the race, but I've seen what we've achieved during COVID and in spite of federal government's efforts to do not much and to blame others, I truly believe we can garner behind um, this and achieve a cleaner economy in a shorter time than what the government's proposing by 2050. If Australians are early adopters, we were the first ones in 2007 to whip out and go get an iPhone, irrespective of how expensive it was. We, we, we're spending our own personal money on putting PVs on our rooftops um, and we're dishing out 
big amount of money for, for electric vehicles. And this is all just happening because of people power, because we want to be part of the solution on a clean and smart economy. So we absolutely have a citizenry that's engaged and wants these solutions. So just imagine what would be possible if we delivered all of this under a national plan and pulled towards a common goal. So this goes to the root of my, of my next and final slide, um, is how are we gonna go and get this done? So what will Nick do? This requires a courageous look at the whole. It's something that the parties are not able, at least haven't shown that been able to do for various reasons. It could be their supporter bases, their ideology, or maybe, maybe their self-interest, I'm, I'm not sure. But when elected, I will advocate for a systemic review of the role of government in the economy and society. So lead, plan and regulate. We wanna know where we're going and why, what good looks like along the way and what my role as a sector or individual or a business owner is in helping deliver that. We wanna look at how the government raises and spends money. Now I've pulled these three things together. I'm working on them, happy to hear suggestions, but I want them to be fair I want, I want a system that's fair, sustainable and productive, and it has to be aggressively transparent and we need to be reporting against criteria to everybody so everyone can hold the government to account for its performance. We want to identify the vehicles to commence implementing the needed reforms. Um, I say, again, the Henry Tax Review, the Productivity Commission, Infrastructure Australia, Insurance Council of Australia, and you know, let's even look at St Vincent de Paul's proposals of bringing back some sort of universal wage um, and tweaking tax and super, nothing is off the table. So, but this only works if we immediately legislate for that federal ICAC. And of course, I think we're also gonna need a stronger and better resourced national audit office whose recommendations actually count for something. Um, and we need to also regulate, uh, sorry, we also need to get through the parliament as a matter of urgency, the member for Ringer's uh, Zali Stegel's climate action bills. That's also going to give us the framework that will help get our uh, modern economy started. So if you, sorry, Ed, the, the sort of take home is that if you keep voting for the same people, you're going to have the same stuff, the status quo. What I'm offering is to agitate and to advocate for better. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think I've successfully uh, Take myself off mute. Um, so, team, the next thing that we are going to do is just explore a couple of um, questions uh, raised through the budget um, process. So, I'll, I'll ask Nick a couple of questions there. Um, whilst we're going through this next section, I, I have seen a couple of questions come through in the chat. I would encourage you to um, post more questions in the chat. So, if you haven't used the chat function in uh, um, Zoom before, if you just hover your mouse up near the top of your Zoom uh, window, uh, it will give you the uh, a little sort of drop down will appear and there's a little speech bubble, which is the chat, the chat function. When you click on that, you'll see the chat on the right and then you can just post your, um, your question or comment uh, in there. So Nick, um, obviously last week the budget came down, then um, uh, there was the, the response from, from Labor a couple of nights later. Um, before we get into any of that, I keep coming back to well, the economy is going pretty well, isn't it? Like, so, you know, record low unemployment, strong growth, plenty of space to inc increase rates if inflation does take off. So what do you really think needs to be done differently? Whoa. Okay. Firstly, can I, I'm, I don't know if I cut through it, but I can understand why you think it's going well. But my point is that there's some cherry picking in the numbers. So we do have the highest level of debt in Australia's history. Our nation's productivity is uh, has flatlined, if not starting to decline. It's slipped in the world order. Um, we And down here on the ground in Bradfield, there are so many retail outlets currently for lease or sale, uh, and small business is, is still hurting. Um, the recovery from COVID, people are still working from home and not out in the streets um, in, in, in our communities. Wages haven't kept up with the cost of living. That's really serious, very, very serious. And there's just certain sectors like, like tertiary education that's just crippled. And housing is absolutely 
the furthest you can imagine from being affordable, well, at least for me, <laughs> and and for our kids. You know, it's not just here in Bradfield; it's all over the, the country. So, look, as we recover from COVID um, and a, adapt to that, the ongoing climate impacts and decarbonising our economy, I think it's just the perfect time to think about a plan for the economy. And the budget didn't give us that. We really need a plan that's going to do, as I said before, give us that the fairness, sustainability and the productivity that we need to be competitive um, and in our 21st century economy. So you don't think that any of those issues were addressed, addressed through the budget at all? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, look, the budget was just a missed opportunity to re-gear the economy. Like we're at a crossroads. Um, so it's we're still subsidising, taxpayers are still subsidising fossil fuels. Uh, and we just can't do that any longer. We should be using that money for things like lifting wages in the aged care sector. So no, um, look, these days the budget's just be used as a political document. Um, the focus is short term. It's focused on what different groups will receive. And this is, you know, especially true in an election year. I just, there was no forward thinking planning that will help our economy to decarbonize or adapt to climate impacts, to drive productivity, and just to support and our recovery out of COVID for the long-term prosperity. I, it was sorely lacking and I'm not feeling very gracious at all. <laughs> Thanks. So, and so you say it was a missed opportunity and it's used as a political document. How do you want to see the budget used in future? Yeah, thanks. So I see a budget as just one tool that a government can use in its toolbox. Um, and that its job is to provide some leadership and to put some guardrails around the market to protect consumers and, you know, make basically invest in our society the things that the values um, have I'm going to go on to the justice system, but I'll, I'll stick with economy here. So when we sit down and take a systematic look to, um, to reform the economy, to be fair, sustainable and productive, that budget is just one tool. And it needs to be set in that context of being consistent with that broader suite of things. So we need leadership, um, including a national plan that on energy, for example, a national plan for achieving net zero by 2050, including meaningful targets for 2030 or 2035. We need a plan for repairing the aged care system, for making childcare affordable and available. We need plans we, and we also need actions, all that, we need leadership. We need those guardrails, as I mentioned, for consumer protections um, and market loves barriers and boundaries. It's like it's an innovative push. Let me see how I can go against that. Um, and we need legislation for better transparency. I cannot harp on about that enough. We need better transparency for consumers so they're empowered to make better informed decisions as consumers. And we also need um, better transparency in the Australian Parliament. But the federal and state governments in this federated system, there's so much inefficiency and people pulling different ways. We saw that during COVID, for example. We've seen it in so many different ways um, in the recovering from um, bushfires um, and other disaster and relief recovery efforts. The, the federal and state government working closely together to support forward planning is a really important thing to do. And one of these for a modern economy would be better building standards for homes and businesses so that they can weather the physical impacts of climate um, do I have to mention the federal, federal ICAC again with teeth? <laughs> but I wanted to say also that the, um, the National Audit Office is really, really important instrument in that as well, because it's going to ensure that when taxpayer money is allocated to initiatives, that it's spent appropriately. And there's this extra, I suppose, watchdog looking over it as well. So there's, there's plenty we can do, um, but it won't necessarily have to cost money. It's about coordination it's about leadership it's about regulation and and for example and this is in the the henry um tax um, package one of the 138 recommendations let's have a look at um you know penalizing people that make pollution and harm the environment which is one of our assets that gives us our vibrant economy and it's a great place to live as well in the environment let's penalize them by taxes or levies or, or maybe a price on carbon, for example, 
And then let's um, use that to improve the economy or let's not have taxes on things that make us smart or um, like, I know it's a state issue, but the idea of payroll tax is something we, you know, work, having people in work is a good thing, sort of thing that we should look at not taxing as much. There's a way of rebalancing the signals that we set into the economy. That doesn't cost us anything necessarily. It's about balancing it so we get better fairness, equality, competitiveness, and sustainability. And so Nick, you, you started sort of touching on tax there and, and oh. the budget largely is focused on, I mean, yes, tax is mentioned a little bit, but it's largely focused on the, the, the spending side. Um, uh, I'd be interested, you know, I mean, I'm just gonna ask the question bluntly, do you think you need to increase taxes? Is that the plan? I'm going to say it's a step back. It's a whole systems view at what needs to be reformed. And as I just was talking about, it's not about necessarily increasing one thing. It's about looking at what objectives we want to achieve as a society. How do we build an economy on those? And how do we use the tax system as an instrument to reflect those values and deliver the outcomes we want? And so to that point, if we want less pollution, let's send the market a signal that pollution is bad by making it more expensive. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So on that case, yes, but let's then also reduce taxes on things that are good and contribute to things that improve the types of things we want in our society, like a dignified retirement, um, aged care and end of life. So that's, I, I'll give you one more example if I can. Um, having come out of working in um, investment land and particularly in superannuation, it's, um, it's really less about increasing or decreasing taxes, just about making sure things are efficiently raised, um, you know, revenues raised well and in place. So it just, in the case of superannuation, intentionally or unintentionally, what we've created is a fabulous system for retirement for people who are workers. But unintentionally, we've created inequality in our, in our society from implementing this as well, between genders, between people involved in the gig economy versus full-time workers, and between now, now and future generations. So when we look at, when you ask the question quite simply is about increasing taxes, it's about having to look at all of the pieces of the system. And, and, and I think actually, I, I want to go back over, I started rereading the tax, the Henry tax review, um, which is actually quite a fun read, but I think he almost nails it. He has some really high level principles about this concept of balance um, between these things. And it's, it really does look at the whole system. So no, it's not about raising taxes necessarily, but yes, we will have to dial up something. Maybe it's GST dial down something else, maybe um, the net result gives us a fairer and more efficient system overall. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, I have seen some questions coming through in the chat, so I will shoot a couple through to you. Uh, first off was Kate Beat, who um, in your original sort of uh, discussion of your position, um, you were talking about uh, bringing production closer to um, urban areas, thanks to, to energy. And Kate just asked a question about being curious how a, a, any business will afford the land and the economics of growing food close to Sydney. So can you talk a bit about how, how um, that will be supported uh, in the future economy? Oh, what a wonderful question. And it's a really good point. Um, it, I think so much of the answer to that question is going to be a function also about what our migration policy is going to be. Um, because, of course, um, workforce participation, uh, you know, will we be growing our urban, our regional centres to be places that are, are more sustainable in terms of keeping children through the generations living there because there are places of employment and industries in regional centres? Um, that can only happen, of course, if we are more generous and considered in terms of migration. Um, and Frankly, a lot of people just love to live near the beaches, right? That's the, <laughs> the part of it all. So I, I think it's a really fair question. Do I have an answer for that one? Um, no, but I've, I've seen some really interested, interesting mixed use pieces. So what you might have is, um, I don't know, maybe there was a car manufacturing facility, I'm thinking about South Australia now, which um, you know, kept some of its, it's got, a, it's got a warehouse where it's got componentry that it still sells through the markets, but it's just reused its land and repurposed it to 
lease it to the value chain of Coles and it's growing tomatoes there um, on, you know, on a lease. So there are, who knows, but as industries fade out and new ones come in, um, there's just opportunities of, of bringing, having a more integrated um, urban cities. And just finally on that, I have to say climate change, um, <laughs> climate change part as well, is that the more we bring um, vegetation into, and I know we're talking about greenhouses, but vegetation into our urban centres, we also do help improve and reduce the um, heat sink factor um, of cities, which is also going to help us um, mitigate our impacts um, on dealing with the physical impacts of climate change as well. Um, and there were a couple of other uh, comments that came through as to suggestions as to how people might be able to help there around um, uh, using urban farms powered by solar um, and hydroponics and high, higher yield per area by using cheaper and more abundant energy to, to grow the crops. So I think there's some, some interesting ideas that have come through. Thank you. Um, uh, we had a question about taxes, which I think we have um, uh, covered. Um, there was a question, Rob, I might turn to you here. I haven't got it specifically in front of me. Um, uh, there was a question in here um, about a price on carbon. Um, so Nick, can you share your views on, uh, on a carbon price? Um, yes, I can do that. Um, so the member for Moringa, uh, Zali Stegel's climate um, action bills don't um, put in place a price on carbon per se. So that would be something I'd be very um, keen to prosecute. It's um, the Business Council of Australia and almost every business group you can find um, say that putting a price on carbon is one of the cheapest ways to deliver um, and get basically put the finance and business sector to work <laughs> um, instead of using taxpayers' money, let's use business money to find solutions that are least cost and get us closer to um, net zero by 2050 as soon as possible. So um, I would be very interested in doing that. I think there is some really good, um, I've got three different versions of an emissions trading scheme on my laptop, Ed. So once I'm elected, I'm popping those out again. Um, um, but I, we would have to sit down and relook now that other um, bilateral trading partners have their own schemes. We need to just to touch base on what the different models might be that might be best suited to to tap into um, our, our competitors and our and our collaborators internationally. And Nick, sticking with um, renewables for the moment, um, uh, how would you tackle the light dark cycle in renewable energy, which presumably is night and day, I guess. Um, yeah, that comes down to thinking, this is the idea about uh, electrifying the, the network um, and building in storage. So we do have Snowy 2.0 um, as an enhancement for some of that storage. There's, um, there's uh, very big plans afoot through, uh, for example, Twiggy Forest in terms of hydrogen, um, hopefully green hydrogen. Uh, for storage as well but a lot of this is going to be leaning on batteries that go into cars and and for households that's that's what we're looking at to plug into your house or your workplace when the sun's up um and you know the great thing is we don't live in England where it's like dark most of the time <laughs> we have a really sunny place um Australia so so once we have a, a, play, a way to store these in batteries, we can um, have energy dispatch at night time when those cars are parked there. Um, of course, this is not necessarily just a, this is a whole in network that's linked up with Internet of Things that we can um, model and people can buy and sell their power if they've got too much in their cars that they want to sell onto the grid. Um, and then we can leave the grid people to dispatch that um, solar power that's been stored in cars at night time to where it's needed. Um, sticking with energy, but switching uh, to another form of um, energy that we don't talk about too much, which is nuclear. What are your views on nuclear energy? Does it have a place in the Australian energy mix? Uh, not at the moment with the current technology, no. It's, um, it's too expensive. Um, no private investors want to invest in it. It uh, uses a lot of fresh water. Um, no one really wants to have it in their backyard. And it just comes down to the fact that renewable energy is so much cheaper and so much, it's, it's here now. A lot of, if you wanted to bring on a nuclear power station, 
it's probably going to take at least 10 years. And we don't have that. We're going to turn greenhouse gas emissions around in this decade. The three IPCC reports that have been delivered in the last three weeks implore us and our nations to turn that around, peak emissions and reduce like this decade. Great, right, thanks. Um, uh, Tony Burnett asked a question. Um, we, we've touched on the federal ICAC uh, and he's interested in hearing about more about how a, a federal ICAC will help implement these economic uh, positions, implement improved economic management, shall we say. Yeah, so the federal ICAC is one part. There are other elements we also need to put on to improve integrity and accountability. But the intention of this, and I keep hammering on about the federal ICAC, is that the, we, we have to have accountability. Um, I, I'm just thinking about my role in business here. If I, was, if I was the executive manager of a business, I would have a plan. I would have my, um, my goals, my objectives. I'd set KPIs. I'd be delivering against them. And if I hadn't, um, I, I'd be saying, why not? And I'd also be talking about, um, you know, review of what to do differently. Now, that's not going to be the, the, the role of ICAC, but it's going to be able to shed light on not on what's been done, but how decisions are made. So what we're not going to have is if we have a, if we have a plan and um, we find that all of a sudden the ministers are making discretionary calls about the allocation of funds to car parks, for example, then we have an inst we have a, a, a concerns and grievance mechanism that could be triggered through a federal ICAC by anybody um, in the parliament or anybody else to say, wait a second, is the basis on which that has been um, that decision has been made consistent with blah 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 blah. So it gives us it just brings accountability, which is sorely lacking in our federal parliament. We have an federal ICAC, we have an ICAC ish thing in every other state and most territories in Australia. I think ICAC-ish thing is my favourite phrase. Well, it's because so. we've got an IBAC <laughs> in Victoria and you've got a, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a broad question from Michael Hyde about um, poor productivity in Australia and wondering whether it's related to the lack of manufacturing here. Oh, good question. There are so many, possibly, but it, it's, we've just got really cheap subsidised fossil fuel energy. So there's been really very much, very little in the, you know, interest in, in cleaning that up. Um, there's some workforce aspects to that as well. Um, Michael, I might need to take that on notice. It's a it's got a lot of complexity in terms of the inputs to that figure. Um, and I'm going to do a follow-up from Michael as well, which is on a slightly separate topic, but same, same asker. Um, uh, Norway has an excellent way of filling its coffers through fees for its mined resources or drilled resources. Um, should Australia be doing the same thing to finance the reform of our economy? It's a good one. Um, the horse may have bolted on most of the stuff we've already pulled out of the ground, but we do have a beautiful um, reserve in terms of the minerals and resources we need to electrify the planet so that we can make it renewable, um, sitting in rare earths and other type things. Uh, so it's absolutely something we can have a look at doing, yes. Yes. That would be prudent. Um, now, given you will shortly be one of these, an MP, um, uh, Rob Drinkwater has asked a question about uh, uh, MP pensions and entitlements post um, office. Um, would you be intending to cut or reduce the parliamentary um, pension scheme for both current and past serving MPs? Um, great question. I think the thing I probably want to put up the front is. Um, electoral funding reform, <laughs> really, how much people can spend um, to, you know, in election campaigns, um, the level of disclosure around donations to campaigns, those things seem to be something I want to achieve first. Um, it's definitely worth having a look at. There's um, two schools of thought about this, is that if it's um, too unattractive financially to go into politics, then um, you might not get some of the sharper minds. But I think the real question is if it's fair, if it looks commensurable with the sorts of responsibility and roles of others, then yes. I, I just don't think we should, we, MP, should have, you know, um, the golden handshake and goodies for the rest of our lives. Why not have a superannuation system much like other workers? 
um, that's it's all about parity. It's all about fairness, I think. Great. Um, now, this is a great one from Karen. Uh, and you, you picked up on the short term nature of, um, uh, of the budgets and, and policy the, the effectively the three year cycle. Um, how would you change the nature of this? How would you um, approach making it longer term thinking? Well, thank you. Um, I, sorry that I'm stuck in climate just for a minute. Um, one of the wonderful things about the member for Warringah's uh, climate action bills is that it actually separates some of the powers, for example, of um, uh, decision-making around climate. So the Climate Change Commission would be a separate organisation that looks at the science of climate change and it has, um, and it produces five-year rolling emission reduction targets. How is this linked to the economy? Part of that job is to come up with emission um, reduction plans for different sectors of the economy. For example, we know we can get an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the um, domestic household energy sector within about seven and a half to eight years. But when we look at some of the other industrial processes with very large um, capital investment to um, you know 40 year assets, it, we might not only be able to get steel done in maybe 50, you know, 50 percent in the same period. So um, by having the separation of powers, we get some some really good um, solid uh, objectives that are not just monetary, they're about objectives in the economy we want to achieve. And then the budgets that get set by government have to in some ways. Um, and remember, it's not just about budgets, there's all sorts of instruments that the government can do that don't cost us money, but they then support the implementation of those emission reduction plans for those sectors through their budget. So having those separate things, the setting of tasks and objectives separate to the political process in this instance would be very helpful. All right, thank you. Uh, Gillian Turner's um, come up with an interesting question around being an independent. Um, so if you're elected, how will you use your independence to drive for constructive change? And what do you see as the areas on which you might have the best chance to gain real traction for positive outcomes? Uh, recognising that it may depend a little bit on which of the major parties um, is elected, or sorry, is in power. Yeah, um, it's a really good question. Um, I have been researching, listening to other independents that have um, been part of both state and federal politics to try and answer that question for myself um, and understand, and understand things like the power, power of the likelihood of a private member's bill getting up, um, you know, um, advocating for your elect electorate um, with some of the government departments to get things done, um, not just setting an, uh, saying yes or no to different laws. But it seems to me that the rubber really hits the road for independence when it comes to um, improving bills that are put forward by the government of the day or, or others from the crossbench, for example. Um, on issues that are very difficult for parties to do. And this, again, hello, federal ICAC. It's not getting done because it's just not, it's just too inconvenient for the major parties to shine light on where all the pork <clears throat> barreling other things are done. So an independent, in fact, an only independence can probably get in there and break that log jam. And I would tend to just say it's the same for climate action. It's been 25 years since I was part of the team that helped get briefing papers done for the Kyoto Protocol negotiations in 1997, we're still here. It hasn't been fixed. So the major parties aren't getting it done. Independents can get in there and agitate and advocate. If you want support on these bills, you've got to give us um, passage on climate action. So that's the kind of thing we can do um, to, to break the roadblock on these important issues. Thanks, Nick. Um, Thomas Gates has asked an interesting question around um, uh, one of the big topics you flagged, which was housing affordability. Do you have any ideas as to what you would look to advocate to help improve housing affordability? Oh, it's so complex. Um, one of the things that I talked about uh, in terms of the economic reform is this look about the relationship between the federal, state and local governments. I think it's one of these questions we need, I think housing affordability, taking New South Wales, for example, is one of those things that we have to look at 
the right raising rising raising GST, obviously, which happens, um, you know, uh, here and federal government trickles it out to the states as it wishes, and the state government obviously wants to have a lovely big stamp duty on housing to secure its income base in case it may not get certain receipts from the feds. So there's a that's just one element of it, of course, but there are, um, you know, nothing's off the table. I, I would say there's 138 recommendations from the Henry Tax Review. I've got some, um, at least some questions that are really nicely worded that would lead to um, some investigation on how to solve for that. But I completely agree, um, to Tom, that's a, a, a very, very big one that needs to be solved because as much as I love my 19 year old son, I'd love him to move out of home sometime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at some point, yeah. <laughs> at some point. No, no pressure, but at some point. Um, Jillian's asked a question about, um, uh, would you be able to do anything about the stacking of federal bodies uh, like the AAT with buddies? Oh, yes. So when I said we talked about sort of, um, federal ICAC plus, that's one of my big pluses. I need to do some more research about how to make that happen, but I'm even seeing it right now because um, I do subscribe to Josh Frydenberg's um, sort of newsletters um, and doorstops. And um, at about one every two days, we're seeing a, an appointment to one of these very important public institutions of people. It, and the pace of those appointments, can I say, have exponentially increased right now, leading up to an election. So, um, the criteria on which those appointments are made, the transparency of those criteria and those processes is absolutely key to um, the integrity of these public institutions. And the public institutions themselves are absolutely key to our democracy and key to public trust. And we need public trust so we can have business operating if, as well. And without public trust, we just, businesses fall apart, capital markets, and you get the picture. So yes, 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 that's a very big one. I think that's term one, Ed, not term two. <laughs> um, uh, just a, a comment, Jeff Ayton, um, uh, this is not a question, it's a comment, um, but it got lots of thumbs up. Um, it's an unreasonable, unrealistic expectation for politicians to have policies and answers on every issue. I've said for a long time that I'm looking for a politician who is honest enough to say, I don't know, but I'll work on it, or I was wrong. Uh, my point is that I'm sure a lot of Australians are fed up with being fed spin. And the time has come for honesty and openness. Don't be afraid to show it. So um, I think that's just a good a good guide for for um, helping us make sure we don't have to have an answer for for, for every question. And um, and Ed, if I might just on that one really quickly as well, I think as an independent without a big party machinery behind me as well, uh, that's going to be really really important. That slide that I showed up front is I'm and this is such a wonderful electorate in terms of its um it, its brains trust and experience so yes I'm not the expert on everything but I do have listening skills and I'm a consummate uh, collaborator and and I can get things done so I will be tapping into the expertise which I know I don't have in order to make better policy decisions um thanks Nick now, now team we, it's 28 past eight um there's uh, been an awful lot of comments in the chat, which is fantastic um, to see. We won't be able to get to every single one. Um, Sam, Graham, I might just toss to you and see if there was one last question that I hadn't covered that you um, thought was worth uh, bringing up for Nick. Oh, you're on mute, Sam. I am now unmuted, thank you. Um, no, I've, I think we went there. Um and covered all the all the big ones there are a couple that dropped into a lot more detail which which nick will be covering off um as she as she develops her policy in more detail and goes back to reading the henry review as bedtime reading um but no i, I think i think we're good there ed thank you great awesome so uh just to wrap us up i'm gonna just quickly share screen again so what's next um a few obvious points that I want to raise before uh, handing back to Nick to, to sum up um, her key points on economic management. Obviously, boat one, Buller. Uh, if you keep voting the same way, then things will stay the same. Uh, spread the word. Tell your friends and family about Nick. I can't emphasise enough how important this one is. This is a grassroots uh, campaign. And so if you've liked what you heard, 
Uh, make sure you tell your friends and family to um, come and join us and find out more. Uh, please do help fund the campaign. As much as we would love uh, campaign funding to not be required, sadly, at the moment it is. Um, and finally, uh, integrity. So there's a session uh, next week um, on Monday, uh, 7.30, which is about integrity in politics. And we are being joined by a couple of fabulous guests. Um, so Nick will be on the panel with Anthony Wheely, who's the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity, and also Saffron Zoma, who is the executive director of the Australian Democracy Network. Um, so a really fascinating conversation on an important topic. Nick, I will hand back to you for any closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And so the take home is that, you know, our economy is at a crossroads. And if we take the path to a fair, sustainable and productive economy, we can improve our national security, our international competitiveness, and we can contribute to a habitable planet. Um, and Australia is so fortunately placed to capitalise on the opportunities for a modern economy. So for this to work, you've heard me say it maybe 17 times tonight, we need to put through that federal ICAC. So when the gov government does make decisions on how it allocates money into the economy and our communities, we can interrogate the rationale behind that and test that those decisions have been done well and as intentioned. But to deliver a modern economy, we need leadership and we need planning, including getting those climate bills through as well. And really a vote for the current government in this election is a vote for the status quo. Um, you heard that from Ed as well. We can't afford the status quo. The IPCC, the Committee for Economic Development Australia and even the Business Council of Australia are telling us that we're gonna miss out. So a vote for an independent with real world experience in the issues that matter in this decade will give us a parliament that breaks the status quo and gets on delivering it. That's that's how I'm going to end up tonight. And of course, vote one fuller. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Nick. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for your great questions and your participation. Really appreciate it.